gonna start okay. wrapping. Can I ask? Um, so, okay, I've realized recently, I think in the last couple of years we've seen where there's just like a chokehold on people's mouths, especially the young people, even afraid to to pray out loud or to read the Bible or to even say praise the Lord in church. But when they're outside of church or whatever. So I want to know if that is that like a, a wave or a tap or is it just a season because they're in this adolescent stage or what what causes it because if we're pouring into them we're encouraging them we have thriving youth department but they won't speak or they can't speak you you're you're in a prayer meeting with some of them sometimes and i've had an experience i think years ago when i was assigned to pray with this young person and we were on the phone for half an hour I was trying to bargain with her just to pray just to say a word of prayer. Let me start with the positive. If they are really and truly living or at least striving to live right, that could just be, you know, a struggle that they have. You know, timidity. Sometimes, as, 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 as Sister Renfield put, basically silence, low esteem. Silence can just be classed as timidity. That could just be they don't really they're struggling against the spirit of fear you know but they're struggling with a bit of doubt um so that could just be that and we all struggle with that sometimes you know the, the enemy always comes to throw in oh you, you know you can't pray you can't do this and then we get into this thing of where we try to follow other people and copy other people and be like them a lot of times you know in our churches we're not necessarily encouraged to be who we are in christ we're encouraged to be like so and so and so there can be a lot of that going on where sometimes it's just bad teaching or bad upbringing spiritually where people are not confident in being themselves because they always compare to other people or you know one person is put up as the example and it's like if you're not like that person if you don't say hallelujah like that person then you're nothing and that can just crush and weigh down a young believer that's the positive. I say that because there's the other side where the Bible says the righteous is as bold as a lion. Unfortunately, a lot of our young people are not saved. Yeah, because you can if you can shout on the road for Satan, you can shout for Jesus. And I take and I use myself as an example. Just speak to anyone who knew me in the world. They wouldn't be surprised to see how 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 I carry on now. You lot think I'm, you know, I'm not. No. Yeah. If you saw how I was behaving for Satan, none of this would surprise you. And we are, and this is for parents, and I'm not a parent yet, um, um, but I notice parents are always reticent to just be honest about their children. Sometimes we need to say, We're, our children are not saved. Our youth department's not saved. Yeah? Because the proof is in the pudding. You will know them by their fruit. There is no way you can be on social media and have over 500 posts of you posing in all different ways and you're posting this and you can't open your mouth for prayer that the devil is a liar and actually if we were more honest with our young people they might make a decision to be saved and to not play games but we've allowed so much compromise and rubbish in our churches that our young people can be on road and be on social media and act the fool yeah, but either the pastor don't know in the church or the ministers act like they don't see and they can come and sit on the choir and be timid. I don't believe in it. So a lot of that comes down to bad leadership. I'm sorry to say it. Yeah, we need to treat people how they are. Yeah, if you've been baptized, you need to be held to a standard of someone who says they believe in God. The one thing I have to rate my parents for is they never allowed me to live in my house in a way that they didn't believe. If they, if my mum ever heard, I always say this, if my mum ever heard secular music coming from my room, she will say, what is that? That don't sound like gospel. Turn it off. We have a lot of so-called Christian children who live in their house and they act like sinners Monday to Saturday and their parents know it, but they allow them to go and sit on the choir. Parental weakness is the number one reason for the downfall of our youth. Compromise in the home. Yeah, not holding your children to a stand. If your child's baptized, why are they going to party? Why are they going to prom dressed like a whore? 
You shouldn't have started me off on that one tonight. Yeah? Because I've seen some foolishness and it's still going on. Parents have let down this generation of children. They have let them run wild and loose and carefree on the internet also. Which I always said. I did a, a, a thing a few years ago. Some of you were there called the spirit of the age. Part three. Even on Yam Singh. And I, I showed how the internet is akin to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we are serious about our children, we would not allow them to have unrestricted access to that kind of knowledge. This is why so much of our young men are bound up in porn, that when they get married, they're treating their wife like a porn star. That's why their marriages can't last. Opening themselves up to all kind of curses. That's why they can't open their mouth. How can you open your mouth in front of a holy... If your church has any atmosphere of the Holy Spirit in it, the young people can't open their mouth in front of God. Why? Because they've been consuming Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, and all these stupid rappers all week who are playing in curses into their lives. How can they open their mouth before a holy God? They shouldn't. They might die. Let them keep their mouth shut until they get delivered. We, we, we're playing with God. Yeah, I grew up in a church where if you, listen, by the time altar call come, we're running out the church because we don't want to get called to the front. We felt the draw and the power of God. Yeah, whether we were living holy or not, the service always got to a point where we felt unclean. That doesn't happen no more. Because we are not preaching holiness and, and the power of God unequivocally we're giving people excuses as to why they can remain in sin and still come before god and be okay when you preach holiness unequivocally this is sin this isn't sin it is the priest's job to show the people the difference between the sacred and the profane the clean and the unclean and because we have weak men in weak pulpits preaching weak messages not showing our young people what is clean and what is unclean why would they open their mouth in front of a holy god they can't they're bound and they're going to churches where the preachers can't deliver them because the preachers are compromised themselves Let's move on, because I could go on for another 10 hours on that one. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And amplified, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Oh, here we go. I forgot this was next. Or cowardice or fear. But he has given us a spirit of power, love and and of sound judgment and personal discipline. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit knew. And he did. Abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He that overcometh shall inherit the th all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. It's the deal. And you opened up a can of worms and we go and go right back. Because last year we had the power of holiness uh, in January. All right. And for those of you in the prayer group, you remember I, I sent that thing called Warring for the Millennial Mind. And that was specifically to do with young people. I'm going to read what God revealed to me when I preached that message. Because that night we had young people in there. And the atmosphere was so tough to break. It was so tough. And I thought, I, I know I've done my, 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 my preparation. I know that God has given me this word. Why, why does it seem that these young people are so what is what is it so hard to break i'm gonna tell you what god revealed to me i'm gonna read it some of you would have heard this before so i put here there is a final call going out to this generation if we do not war a good warfare they will be lost the intensity of a constant assault on satan's kingdom must not cease we need a multilateral effort against the forces of darkness so here i put out the facts of war. these are the things that god revealed to me while i was preaching that message Holiness messages are not being preached to young people. They are unaware and uninitiated into the true power of God. The power of God has become a fairy, 
are not a practical reality to a generation. They have been initiated into a form of godliness. They are bound by fierce demonic forces who have had free access to their ear, to their eye and ear gates. The preaching of unequivocal holiness must continue to be preached with unction and anointing until the spells and curses that have been assigned to them has been broken. The sacrifice of much unified intercessory prayer and protracted fasting will need to be used in the defeat of these principality spirits who have not only been empowered by technology but also by weak parenting and carnal preaching and unsanctified ministries and ministers. We need some priest to weep between the porch and the altar who will say, Spare thy people, O God, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? This precedes God's pouring out his spirit in all flesh. There must be a sacrifice. It is the only way to God. If our young people, through the week, have been consuming garbage sent from the pit of hell, one Sunday morning preaching is not going to be enough to undo a whole week of cursing and devilment. The enemy is not playing. Just look at some of the lyrics, and we've, you've seen it on Yam, of what these people are saying. This is what our children are listening to and enjoying and reveling in. That demonic TikTok that our children are enjoying. All of these challenges, I think, that, what do you think the enemy is trying to do? All of these challenges come with a sound. There's always a soundtrack to sin. What did they? What did God? What did uh, Nebuchadnezzar want them to bow to? When the idol was revealed, wasn't it not music? So all of these challenges and all these things they did on TikTok is it a gospel song? And there was always some clown who wants to come out with a gospel version of what Satan done because they can't they they can't go in fasting and prayer and get an original idea from God. But what do we think the enemy is doing with these challenges and with these? These, these apps and these things. Yes, they can be used for good, but our children are not using them for good 99.9% .9 of the time. And we have dropped the ball on our youth and that is why they are in the state they are in. And as that thing said, if we ain't willing to put now in the hard graft of sacrifice, of real prayer and fasting, who gonna deliver them? Who gonna cry for them? Because sometimes it's like their parents don't even care enough. I don't know why we took this uh, diversion. But let's, let's wrap this up. Sorry, Michael. Oh, yes. Michael, sorry. <clears throat> no, you've made re some really good points. Because it is really, 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 really important that we, we take back the youth. And it's going to have to start in the spiritual realm. And God is raising an army, an army of people within their own families, an army of people within the kingdom who are tarrying in prayer, who are willing to go and to fight in those depths, you mm. know, mash down those prisons, break those bottles where them souls have been trapped. Um, it's not just the here and now, but some things are generational as well. And you have yep. to be prepared to stand up and say, you know what, I've had enough. Lord, yep. I've had enough. Where do we go from here? And yep. you have to be prepared to pull your family out. And this is why I'm grateful for lockdown. If I'd known that the Lord was going to do this, I'd probably be like, no, God, don't do this. Don't lock us down. Don't lock. But this is the best thing that could have happened for the kingdom. And yep. those parents who are fortunate to be home, I know it's hard. It's hard to be working and schooling at the same time. But you've got the opportunity now to really get to know your children. Take them back. Yes, they still need to have their education and you might not be able to do the education yourself, but you can take back a lot. By them being, you're being under the same space for the same amount of hours, the amount of pride you can put in and you just keep going, keep acting away. Because I've seen that with my son. I've mm. been acting away for years. There's things that he's revealed to me that he went through. And I mm. knew I could feel the heaviness. I didn't know exactly what. <clears throat> and even he said that, like, this lockdown season, of, of all the years he's been in church, this is the time where he's really grown in God. And 
it's pulled him um, to make his decision. It's pulled him to the place where he needs to be and things that he's cutting away. And the Lord is just chipping and molding him. And, you know, it's the same with, with Sydney as well. And I can feel the pull. I can feel the, the, the battle. Like even this week, it was heavy. There were so many things coming. There were so many things that I had to just be fighting against. But it's like having the revelations that God gives. He gives you the tools to manage, you know. And when your shield is big enough, then you can just cover your family. And when your sword is big enough, you can just swipe down a couple of things at the same time. But we have to just remember that the enemy is there to wear us out. We just got to know when to take rest and when to go, listening to the Lord. And sometimes there's a, there's a waiting period. You have to just wait on the Lord and we have to just trust in him. And sometimes with our children, we want to just, we want them there, but you have to just keep going. You have to just keep going in the spirit, in the spiritual realm and just keep praying because God's hearing. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. I've cried. I've cried, I've been at the lowest point, I've wanted to give up, but I've just had to keep going. And to, to what's been revealed to me is that it's not so much about me, but it's about this generation, it's about getting them prepared. And even like Sydney, she's now gathered with some other like-minded children that she's met through Zoom. Um, and they've, they've made a friendship and they gather together twice a week to read and they pray together. And the way that the Lord is moving in them, in this group of seven to eight year olds, it's just amazing. It's amazing to watch. And, um, you know, he's just working in them mightily and he's raising an, another generation. And we have to prepare them because what they're gonna have to go through, we won't experience to that extent. The weight is gonna be heavier. The road is gonna be even narrower. Some of us may not be alive in their time. But we've got to prepare them. And some may not seem like they're, they're on the page now, but they will get there, especially if we pray for them. And we put them before the Lord every day. Put them before the Lord. So Amen. That's that's Sabrina said in the chat, return to the scripture that says, train a child in the way that they should go. Um, a lot of training for us adults, but children, youth get neglected. Train fighters, not storytellers, as they can say what God has done for their parents, but what about what he has done for them? That is very truthful because to a certain extent, um, we, we get, you know, we start off by knowing the God of our parents, but we hopefully all transition to knowing our own personal God. Okay, I'm coming to you, BM. Um, so what, what I believe we have, to, I, I, I can totally concur. We've got to train, and I've been saying it for, for a time on the end. This is a generation who have to be trained for a totally different style of warfare. It's the same war, it's just a different style. It's going to be fought in a, in, in you know, you, you're going to have to defend and attack. Well, no, our attack is the same. Our weapons ch don't change. But the, 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 the way we do it in terms of um, the way we operate now, the methods have to have to slightly change because we're in a different time. And as I said in that statement, the enemy um, is using technology. And so therefore, if he's using technology, why aren't we using technology? And Zoom has helped us to get to that point. But um, BM... I think that's Beulah McKenzie, is it? Yes, tis I. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, everything that everyone's said, I can 100% um, agree with. Um, but there is something else to consider. And that is that because there is a lack of, well, I'll say in some places or some areas, there's a lack of discernment. So what tends to happen is that people are shoehorned into areas for which they, in which they have no business being. They're just, they're not supposed to be there. And even if you know that and you try to express that, um, 
being in the wrong place or serving the wrong place and not being able to do what you know you can do is extremely damaging to your own, to your self-esteem as well. Uh, so sometimes what we perceive as false humility or mm. um, you perceive as like, oh, come on, this person's not, you know, we, you know, no, actually, I don't, I actually don't have skill in that area or that you know that there's, so there's a lot of mismatch. So the singer is on the keyboard and the keyboard is, is the Sunday school teacher and the Sunday school teacher is the, is the prayer warrior and the, the, the prayer person is, so yeah. every, there's lots of people just in the wrong place. So mom, instead of, um, you know, the person who's great at administration is the person that's being asked to, so all of that, um, because people in, I don't, I don't know if it's, um, they're too busy to be able to really see who should be where, or I don't know what the, the reasons are, but because there isn't a correct placement of people in, 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 in ministry and, and not correct, like looking at someone and saying, I see this mm. in you, you just put people in the wrong place. They can't, they feel uncomfortable. They can't get it right. Even, especially if someone actually even knows where they are supposed to be kind of supposed to be or they feel accord in a certain area but no you, you you should be over here and i do hear a lot of people saying oh when god's ready he will open the door and like do you know what sometimes it just doesn't happen because of a, a, a leader's or a person's obstinance yeah you know there's a lot of people who are who who the best years of their life in, oh, in church wasted. have been wasted um, when they had the burn, when they had the time, when they had the passion for that in that area, and you could see it was plain as day, because they were either misdirected or put in a wrong place, whatever, it ended up crushing their um, um, their self esteem, their confidence in their calling in Christ, and eventually they just they're just a withered plant in the corner because they're not, and and that that is very very critical, and everything that everyone else has said is absolutely correct. But I think that is one of the most devastating uh, things. So, so that because that those those doors were open and then they shut. And there were a lot of people say, "Oh, when God ready to use you, is going to use." It. No, if a man is standing in the way, or, or there's people in the way, make it off. That's it. sometimes that's just how <laughs> that's just how it is. And that's the sadness that God wants us to see. He actually wants us to see the sadness. And he's like, this is what could have been. There's some people that were in their 40s now or 30s now who could have, the, the warriors or the people or the shadowing or the, the youth leaders that you were looking for, they were those, they were them. But because they were put in the back room to, you know, set the table when the Part of visiting pastors are coming so that they can eat their dinner or whatever misdirection or misplacement they were put in it just didn't happen and it impacts a generation so yeah and um i want to go back to make to build on that to make or to add to that to i want to go back to a point i made in the beginning and add a second part to that because funnily enough i've been thinking about what you were talking about but from another angle um, so in the beginning, I mentioned about ministries, sometimes trying to make people after their own image and in their likeness. When the, Remember I said I started with the positive, right? And that is sometimes people don't have the right guidance or they're not under the right ministry to help them to get to where they need to be. Or people are trying to make them like someone else when, like you said, you know, that person should be a, he, heading up the prayer team, but You've just got them stuck on the keyboard because that's you know what they know how to do and i'm going to go forwards to go backward i'm going to give a personal example i believe this falls under and unfortunately our type of churches um have suffered from this as well a lack of understanding of the kingdom right some ministries just need to let some people go what we have not understood is yeah the kingdom is the kingdom and our church is not necessarily the kingdom it might be that brother a grows up gets married ends his life in that particular church that could be there what they need to do but some every church or every ministry that exists is not for every individual who goes to that place to stay in that place because if god has not given 
one has not given everything to one person he's not given everything to one church right so whereas this church might be a specialist in prophecy you might be an evangelist and for you to grow in the in the in the way that you need to grow as an evangelist you need to go to another ministry that actually that's their specialism and that ministry will help you to grow in evangelism now you may end up going back to where you came from you may not you may stay at that place or you may move to somewhere else but whatever the case you need to go to grow we unfortunately not in every church so when i'm speaking in general terms i'm talking about everyone but a lot of churches do not have the mentality of you know like brother you know what I see what you are supposed to be. I don't think you're going to get that here. Why don't you go to brother so-and-so's church? That really doesn't exist. Because we see someone with talent, we just want to keep them. And build up our church and build up... No, no, no. We have a very church mentality and not a kingdom mentality. There's a lot of, as Bula was saying, there's a lot of young men and young women who should have been released to go. And they haven't. And that is a travesty. And a lot of people's lives have been wasted and they have never grown and they have never fulfilled potential in the time they should have. Now, we know God can help them to redeem the time, but you know what? You can't get the energy of a... Or you're not going to have the the, 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 the the time and the energy of a 30-year-old when you're 60. Yes, we know God can give it, but it's not going to be the same because guess what? God makes everything beautiful in its time. So if you were meant to be that guy in 1980, you can be that guy in 2010, but it won't be the same yeah and so because we have had a lack of understanding of the kingdom because we have not shared resources with each other and we've been very proud and arrogant there's a lot of people who could have benefited from rubbing shoulders with this church and maybe going into that ministry for a couple of months or maybe you know go into that ministry for a year to develop and maybe it was for them to come home but they didn't but let me add this element to it and i can give you a personal testimony if that has been the case right it's not because god didn't give those individuals opportunities to maybe go to grow the fact that you don't grow is never going to be down to someone else other than you now don't get me wrong if those ministries and ministers have been responsible for suppressing gifts they will have to answer to god for that right that's that's fine but you're going to have to answer to the God because the God that I serve and I know and I've experienced makes opportunities. And I can guarantee you every person who's had 20 years of their life wasted, God created a situation where they could have left. Or they could have got what they needed to get. Now, whether through fear or unbelief or doubt or, or, or loyalty or loyalty that they shouldn't have had they have now suffered now this is not casting a saying they're going to go to hell no no i'm saying that you know that can happen and you still make it in so this is not a heaven and hell issue i'm saying that god will always provide a way <laughs> of escape literally and spiritually now whether that individual has taken that is up to them but let me tell you that there is no way no man on this earth can hinder your growth you might get delayed people might hide you and you hear apostle smith always talking about people might hide you and you you might get delayed a little but even in that delay god will teach you something and so it's a it's it's almost a paradox and a bit of a dichotomy where yes what you're saying a hundred percent a lot of people's time has been wasted but those people they are responsible for their time being wasted it sounds harsh yes their ministers will have to answer but they're also responsible because God gives us a chance. He gives us an opportunity. And sometimes through fear, doubt and unbelief, sometimes we think we deserve to be stuck in the back room. Yeah, sometimes we think that's all our job is just to clean the church. Now, yes, you should clean the church, but you have a gift and a calling and you have a Bible which tells you you have a gift and a calling. So ultimately what I'm saying is 100% agree, but no man has an excuse to not flourish and grow. It's not going to be acceptable. I'm not going to be able to say to God, my apostle hid me. 
My apostle didn't know my gifting and calling. No, no. God is going to say, no, I made, you remember that time when I spoke to you in prayer and I said, you know what? You need to go here. You need to do this. Oh, but no, 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 no. I never told you. You should have listened to me. And it's a great way to, 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 to round out this study that you, as an individual, and we said it, I think, on the last study, you, your relationship with God is top priority. There is no devil from hell that can hinder your growth in Christ. There is no apostle. There is no deacon. There is no bishop. Not Jezebel. Yeah? Not Satan. Not any of his angels. Not your mum. Not your dad. Your purpose and destiny, whether you fulfil it, ultimately is going to come down to the decisions that you make. Ultimately. So let, it's, let's try and round this out and when we can come back at the end for any comments. We're one and a half hours in now. I can stretch it to another 20 minutes if you want to stay. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He that overcometh cometh, shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into the diverse temptations, knowing that this, the trying of your faith, worketh patience. Impatience is a hindrance. But let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect entire, wanting nothing, will lack nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall all be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven in the wind and tossed. That's doubt. For let any, for let not a man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Make a choice. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise uh, and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. Moses' final sermon, Deuteronomy. Chapters 1 to 30 of the book consist of three sermons or speeches delivered to the Israelites by Moses on the plains of Moab shortly before they entered the promised land. The first sermon recounts the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings which had led to that moment and ends with an exhortation to observe the law or teachings, later referred to as the law of Moses. The second sermon reminds the Israelites of the need to follow Yahweh and his laws he has given them, on which their possession of the land depends, and the third sermon offers the comfort that he should uh, should, even should Israel prove unfaithful and so lose the land with repentance all can be restored so for those of you on the Joshua study this is just before that study starts where we, where we began Moses says see I have set before thee this day life good and death and evil in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that they, thou mayest live and multiply and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it but if in thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear but that shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them i denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish and you shall not prolong your days on the land whither thou passest over jordan to possess it i call heaven and earth to record this day against you that i have set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Yeah, so now we was going to talk, but we've been talking already. That scripture tells me again, and emphasizes my last point, we all have choices. And that scripture was given before they were to inherit the land. Let's take that personally. We have a choice about where, what we're going to inherit and what uh, promises of God we are going to take up. I, in the last study, I did one of the last things we spoke about was don't leave any promises unclaimed. If God has called you, 
to be more than what you are, then there's some promises you need to claim. And let me give you this example. Yam is here because of the exact reason that, or oh, well, not in full, but in part, that Sister Beulah was mentioning. And I'll give you an example. A few months before I left my church, I stopped playing the drums. And I felt strongly that God told me to stop playing the drums. He never told me why. He said, stop playing the drums. Never told me why. I stopped playing the drums. My brother didn't agree with it. Many other people didn't understand it. And, you know, my brother's a pastor. Uh, I respect his opinion, but I don't respect his opinion more than I respect my relationship with God. So even his, um, you know, unhappiness with it didn't bother me. Not, it wasn't disrespect, but I trust my relationship with God more than your ministerial whatever. Yeah. And I called a prayer meeting once um, at my church and we were having a prayer meeting. And I was reading something by Charles Finney with regarding to revival. And part of the statement said that, you know, when we are dealing with revival, if we say we need revival, we have to admit that we the church is dead someone i got up dearly beloved to me got up and what the world would say tore me a new one as they would say in the world and they said you need to just go back and play the drums <laughs> i said thank you jesus because the devil knew that as long as i sat on the drums i would just be michael the i've been playing the drums since i was five so what what in the spirit realm and what a lot of people in the assembly didn't like is that little drummer boy just needs to play the drums and shut up he don't need to be talking about revival and all of these other things and at that moment when that was said god showed me why i needed to come off the drums because i would always be the drummer and god was like i'm taking you in a different direction not that you you you, you know you're never going to play drums again or you're not a musician but you need to come off now you need to focus on what I need you to focus on. And Yam grew. Yam, first of all, if you notice, Yam's name was, it had a prefix, right? Which was the name of the church that I grew up in. It no longer has that name. I'm not gonna have to go into the reasons why. But Yam was born out of that very same frustration that you mentioned, um, Sister Beulah and well part partly of that and wanting to see ministry to my age group specifically and if i did not have the relationship with god i had and have grown to have in these past five years and some of you may know about the extreme and utter um you know whip that god has put me under then Yam wouldn't be here. But the reason why I am where why Yam is where it is now, and why I am a part of the the body that I am now in terms of where I fellowship, where it is actually right in line with where I need to be because God. Let me give you an example. The place where I am now, three, four years ago, I I understood some something about my situation, and I just needed to confirm that what I had understood was correct because my church didn't really deal with this type of stuff in this depth and I went to this church's prayer meeting and I received two signs of confirmation that I would that what I was going through was exactly what I had discovered it was and God said to me that night about that pastor you need to get something from this man that was three years ago maybe it's no coincidence that I find myself under this pastor's ministry now and God has already proven and I'm not saying I have everything that I need to get. I've already got say maybe 50% of what I needed to get from this bishop in terms of wisdom and understanding and whatever else is to come. The devil couldn't restrict what God had for me. The ministry I was under and I'm not trying to put them on blast and I'm not trying to say they're bad, but they didn't understand where God was taking me and what he had for me. And I don't hold anything against them because where I needed to go, they couldn't take me. That's fine. They will take many other people where they need to go. 
And that's great. But guess what? Not me. I needed to go somewhere else because God had something different in, in view. But because I esteemed God and his word even higher than any familial connection, God has enabled me to begin to claim the promises that he has for me. The problem we have is that we esteem the word of man more than we esteem the word of God. How many of you can really say you're willing to put your closest family connections on the line for this thing? We have a saying in the world, are you really about this life? God is going to take you to the point where you have to prove that you would give up mother and father for him. That scripture ain't just for jokes. And so I say that to say, if we really want to be who God wants us to be, there can be nothing between you and God. Nothing. And until we are willing to walk the path that proves that to God, we will never achieve everything he wants us to achieve. We will get stuck 20 years in the ministry. We will get stuck 20 years playing keyboard when we should have progressed and maybe been um, uh, lead uh, on the evangelism team. Yeah, of course you will, because you esteem something higher than the word of God. And so, yes, like I said, these situations do exist where we are restricted. Sometimes it's bad doctrine and bad teaching or bad practice. But ultimately, what does the Bible say? And this is, and, and, and if you, you've heard what I've said regarding the church, this is not to underplay the necess necessity of the church of the body. But doesn't it say in the Bible that when you have the Holy Spirit, it's not, you, don't, it's not even, you don't even need no man to teach you? A sister in my church minister said this once. You must always trust your, the Holy Spirit in you. God as my dad says, as a God of brinksmanship, he's going to bring you to the edge again and again and again and again and again to make sure that you esteem him and his word higher than anybody else. I've said enough today. I'm not going to close now, but I'm going to give um, opportunity for discussion. I had some questions. I'll lay them out. You don't have to answer them, but whatever you want to talk about, you can talk about. But these might be a points of discussion if no one had to say anything. So I was going to ask, are you aware of any areas that you need more growth in? And uh, what, what's your growth plan, if you have one? And that was it. But as we've taken a few different directions, I'm going to open up the floor now for, for discussion. And to, anybody can say, make a point and say whatever they want. So go ahead. Mr. Kemi. Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll just speak from my heart. I feel really moved by the passion in everyone's voices. Everything that everyone has said, I completely agree. But I kind of feel, this is, this is just me talking, I kind of feel slightly overwhelmed. And before we leave this Zoom conversation, which has been very profound. I just want to encourage us because saints, it's not, we've talked about what isn't right, mm. but at the same time, we need to talk about the remedy. Saints, there is a remedy. And it goes back to what everybody has pretty much been saying. It starts in the prayer closet, saints. And I just want to, I just want to use these scriptures to encourage not to put anyone down because saints, we've got to leave here being encouraged. If we leave here feeling overwhelmed because we look at everything that's going on, it is enough to overwhelm you. So saints, we must not be overwhelmed. And I just, if I, if I may, please, Isaiah 62, 6 and 7. I've set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent and give him no rest till he establish, until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. There's another scripture. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get them prepared. Um, Ezekiel 22, 30. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. 
And the last scripture that I just wanted to give is Psalm 16, 11. Thou will show me the path of life, for in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Saints, there is a solution. The solution is everybody needs to go back to the prayer closet. I need to go back to the prayer closet. Saints, there, I think there is something that Leonard Ravenhill says. We don't, we don't have revival because we don't want it enough. Saints, we can get the revival that we want. Do we want it enough? Are we prepared to have all night prayer meetings? Are we prepared, like Brother um, Mike said, are we prepared to make the sacrifice? Now that's for me to decide for myself and that's for me to really find out because God is going to test me. But I'm just, I just want to encourage us saints, things can change. There is power in prayer, but we have got to really hold up one another. Listen, let's go together. We can do this in Jesus' name. It is possible with prayer. So I just want to stop there, but I just want everyone, please don't leave this feeling overwhelmed. With prayer, things can change in Jesus' name. First Peter 1 and 3 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue which can mean moral excellence whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust now hear this what we need to do and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord Jesus Christ. Mr. Kemi mentioned it. And it, it is from the lips and the counsel of the Saviour in the Sermon on the Mount. Secret praying, secret giving, secret fasting. In the chat. Okay. Amen. Is there anybody else? No one else? Okay. So we've mentioned a lot of things today. We're going to have a few prayers. I'm going to ask Sister Cheryl, if you pray for our youth, um, in short, just a couple of minutes, because we are over time. And then, Sister Kemi, if you could pray uh, that we would not only just be hearers of the word, because... We have now heard uh, the principles of growth. We've heard hindrances to growth. So therefore now, knowing what we have heard, we need to do. And then, Sister Dion, after that, I'm going to ask you to pray that we would have the mind and the heart to sacrifice. Because as Sister Kemi said, we can have revival. We don't have it because we don't really want it. And if we don't agree with that, then we make God a liar. So not asking you guys to pray for long, just very straight to the point. A couple of minutes each. So then Sister Cheryl for the for the young people, then Sister Kemi, then Sister Dion. Holy and righteous Father, oh Lord God, we come before you. Lord God, we give you honor. We give you all the praise, Lord. We thank you, oh Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us, oh Lord God, your sacrifice that you made for us. Lord God, we bring before you all the children, all the young people, oh Lord God, and the young adults, Lord God. We bring them before your throne, Lord Jesus. We ask you to arrest them in the spirit, Lord Jesus, that, Lord God, that they will have a reverence for you, Lord God. Lord God, those who already have a relationship and know you, Lord God, I pray, oh Lord God, that they'll be drawn to you, that they'll be drawn to your love, drawn to your comfort, drawn to your word, Lord. I pray that they'll be ambassadors for their generation, that they can minister unto their age groups, oh Lord God. 
that they will have the power to believe, oh Lord God, in their prayers, <clears throat> the power and the faith to believe in your word, oh Lord God, and that they can do all things through you, Lord Jesus, who strengthens them in your mighty, precious name, Lord God, I pray. Cover them and seal them, Lord, always. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Mr. Kerry. Praise the Lord. Father, we give you thanks. We give you all the glory. We thank you for the word that we have heard. Mighty God, you said it. your word is pure, reviving the hearts, making wise the simple. Father, we pray that as we have heard your word, I pray that your word, oh God, hallelujah, would change us, would change our perception, would change our mindset. I pray that, Father God, your word would sanctify us through thy word, for thy word is truth. Help us, oh God, not to be just hearers of the word, but help us to do your word. I pray, oh God, that you will equip us with wisdom and with understanding. I bind every spirit of unbelief. I bind every spirit of fear. And I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, that everyone who hears this word near and far, those that are on this Zoom call, those that have listened and the speaker, I pray that you would give us the ability, oh God, to do your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, we bless your name and we thank you, oh Lord God. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word to us tonight. We thank you, oh God, for always lovingly drawing us. Oh God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will know the length and the breadth of your love towards us, oh God, that you are constantly wanting us, oh God, to be restored to position of, oh God, relationship in you, oh God. Father, you have paid the ultimate price, oh God, you lowered yourself, you came, you sacrificed, you, oh God, you showed us by example, oh Lord God, and I pray in the name of Jesus that as this reality fills our heart and our minds, that we would, oh God, be resolute in our choice, oh God, that we'll be willing to pay the price, oh God, hallelujah, to be a part of the kingdom, to have the hope beyond this life, oh Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that Almighty God, as we listen to your word, oh God, and as the reality hits home, oh God, of the cost, mighty God, that we will be willing, almighty God, to lay down, oh Father God, our very lives for the cause of Christ, oh God. Father, we thank you that you are no man's debtor, that you ask us to pay nothing, that you will not restore a hundredfold, oh God. But Father, I pray that you will help us to realize, Lord God, Father God, to gain, we have to let go of some of the things, oh God, that bind and trap us and bound us to this earth, oh God. Father, I pray that you will make us, oh God, light travelers, oh God. Father, we thank you for what you're about to do. We thank you for stirring up our pure minds and, oh God, recharging our, our faith, almighty God. Hallelujah. Father, let our eyes be singular in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And to close out this study, I'm just going to read a prayer uh, that the Apostle Paul prayed, coming from Ephesians 3 and Ephesians 1. And I'll pray on our behalf. Father, grant us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with might by your Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, that being rooted and grounded in love, we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Father of glory, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, so the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of your calling, the riches of your glory of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power towards them who believe, according to the working of your mighty power in jesus name amen so i'd like to thank everyone who's come on from week one if you've just come on now for the first time uh everybody who might be watching on youtube in the future uh we thank god for you we pray the word um would have reached your heart on good ground that it would take root that it would be continually watered and that it would be 
have the temperature uh, that it needs so that you might flourish and grow.